Ryan, I believe you have an animal-themed radar this week. The best animal, the elephant, <laughs> indeed. So earlier this week, I published a story at The Intercept on the widespread phenomenon of mass dysfunction at progressive organizations across issue areas. The story, called Elephant in the Zoom, looks at the way that progressive nonprofits have increasingly become largely non-functional amid internal turmoil. Now, since the story came out, I've heard countless news stories from people along the same lines. One of the most vivid comes from an activist I've known for a long time who told me that back in the spring of 2021, while the climate debate was heating up around Build Back Better, he reached out to a particular climate group for help with a particular issue that they were having, and he was told that the group was taking the next eight weeks, eight weeks, to work on internal issues. Which brings me to another point. So some readers of this story have noted that it fits in well with the bigger narrative we're seeing of worker uprisings everywhere, from Starbucks to Amazon to Kellogg's to coal miners in Alabama. And that unrest is certainly the most exciting thing going on on the left right now. And certainly the new militant mood among workers has in fact bled into the nonprofit space. Why wouldn't it? But those other places are still functioning. You know, imagine if you walked into a Starbucks and ordered a coffee and you were told that actually the shop was taking eight weeks to work on internal issues and not serving coffee, but you still owe $6 anyway. Now, if the workers were on strike, great, then you support them, but they're not on strike. So what we're witnessing also can't be disentangled from the great reckoning we've been having over race and gender in the workplace. And indeed, the period right after George Floyd was murdered caused so much turmoil inside organizations that many haven't recovered. Now, some critics of the piece accused it of being anti-union or anti-worker, but that's missing its point. This article was about workplaces because these nonprofits are also workplaces, but the phenomenon I wrote about is prevalent in volunteer groups, on email listservs, in big DM groups, in neighborhood groups, basically anywhere that people gather together and share even a modestly progressive set of social politics. You'll see a similar phenomenon unfold there. What was different about this article was that it looked at what the effect of it has been on these groups' ability to function. Now, the story also reports on an outfit called ReproJobs that has been heavily disruptive in the reproductive rights space with a Twitter and Instagram feed that is widely followed in the industry. ReproJobs is run by two anonymous organizers who work in the reproductive rights field, as well as a third who is willing to be public. So Emily Likens Ellers offered this week to do an interview with me and said she sympathized to a degree with the complaints of some executive directors that a generational divide and a culture that encourages call-outs had made organizations more difficult to manage. She told me, quote, I don't envy anyone who has to manage an organization right now particularly, but I think they would find that they could actually find more resources if they were willing to ally themselves with the union by accepting the union into their space. Now, at the same time, Things are not going well under the current and former executive directors, she noted, saying, quote, if the managers feel like the conditions are becoming unworkable, that means that the workers are doing a good job disrupting the system. And I think that most of these workers right now know that it's toast. We're screwed. Roe is going to fall any day now, and we are going to have to set up bail funds, unquote. Now, that sense of failure has produced a, fear, a fearful response, she said. She said, quote, People are just trying to grab control where they can and making sure that they have a severance when they lose their job in two weeks or whatever. That has been on the forefront of most workers' minds that I've spoken with. They just want to pay their bills after row falls, unquote. Now, some of the executive directors and organization leaders that I spoke to put the situation in dire terms. And I want to read a few of these and then get Emily's take on this whole thing. So one said, to be honest with you, this is the biggest problem on the left over the last six years. This is so big and it's like abuse in the family. It's the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. And you have to be super sensitive about who the messengers are, unquote. Here's another. So much energy has been devoted to the internal strife and internal BS that it's had a real impact on the ability for groups to deliver. It's been huge, particularly over the last year and a half or so, the ability for groups to focus on their mission, whether it's rep reproductive justice or jobs or fighting climate change, unquote. These reckonings have coincided with a belated appreciation for diversity in the upper ranks of progressive organizations. Now, the mid-2010s saw an influx of women into top roles for the first time, many of them white, followed more recently by a slew of black and brown leaders at most major organizations. 
One I spoke with compared the collision of the belated respect for black leaders and the upswell of turmoil inside institutions with the, quote, hollow prize thesis. The most common example of the hollow prize is the victory in the 1970s and 1980s of black mayors across the country just as cities were being hollowed out and disempowered. Or, for instance, salaries in the medical field collapsed just as women began graduating into the field. So one executive director told me, quote, I just got the keys and y'all are going to come after me on this. I said, it's white supremacy culture. It's urgent. No, it's election day. We can't move that day. Just do your job or go somewhere else, he said. He added, being black has by no means shielded executive directors or their deputies from charges of facilitating white supremacy culture. Quote, it's hard to have a conversation about performance, said one manager. I'm as woke as they come, but they'll say he's black, but he's anti-black because he fired these black people, unquote. The solution, he said, I buy them to leave. I just pay them to leave. So, Emily, do you, are, is the right confronting this turmoil inside institutions, or is, this, or is there something peculiar about the way that it's unfolding inside progressive organizations? Because you're seeing it not, it's not limited to the progressive space, major corporations, the, the, the tech sector, like lots of places are seeing this. What about inside, say, like AEI or the Heritage Foundation or the Federalist? <laughs> no, actually, and that's an interesting question because one of the big, um, one of my big takeaways from your story is how closely it mirrored the leaks that we have seen from major corporations, that this is happening maybe most acutely in the progressive space, but it is more broader in the culture. It's way more widespread. It's at tech companies. It's at banks. It's, at, it's really everywhere, except I haven't seen much of it on the right. And what's interesting is that it does seem to be almost that we've pathologized or we've allowed ourselves to accept that being uh, maybe bad at your job for certain reasons is an excuse and you we've given this idea that like it's a it's some sort of pathology or it's some sort of um, identity that just it's plainly like the guy saying right there you're called anti-black if you're black and you fire black workers it's is crazy I mean you can't even you you cannot control for performance. You cannot um, meaningfully like, actually enforce performance standards because the rebuttal is going to be, well, this is, you, you use the shield of identity. And it's crippling, not just progressive organizations, but I think it's crippling our ability as a broader society to just function to like when we're giving out vaccines um, with racial like w racial standards who can get it first um, there's just certain things that I, I mean I think back to the Katie Herzog story from last summer about how uh, in emergency rooms there was this push in 2020 um, in one particular place to to keep police out of emergency rooms but police actually protect people from criminals who come back to like finish the job. Mm -hmm. We can't function if we're weaponizing identity at every turn instead of actually being able to adjudicate performance and adjudicate uh, value. And it's a tricky question because obviously several decades ago, discrimination in the workplace was intense and it is not gone. Absolutely. Like, there yeah. still is discrimination in the workplace. And so every time that somebody says, uh, I got a bad performance review because this is discrimination against me doesn't mean that they're wrong. Like sometimes they're, sometimes they're right. Right. And so, but then if you have people who genuinely are, you know, doing a, doing a poor job at work and are hiding behind that, then it makes it more difficult uh, for, for people who are genuinely working against discrimination in the workplace to, to bring those complaints forward. And, and, it, and it, the fact that it's not hitting right wing institutions, you know, really does, I think, prove that there is a, that a lot of this is rooted in a, a real and needed reckoning mm -hmm. across, the, across the culture, whereas like Federalists are like, no, we don't. You're saying we're just letting sexism fester. And <laughs> well, also, you, you guys have less racial diversity probably in, at AEI, let's say. Or, uh, I don't know about AEI. I mean, I haven't, I've interned there, but I haven't worked there a long time. I mean, I'm just picking, I'm not picking on AEI. I right. I'm just picking out a right-wing institution that, like, Maybe. There's been, I, there has been. That's a, changed a lot, though, yeah. I would say, in, in the last five years in particular. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so maybe you're going to start to see, because you're going to have, like, 
it, like a lot of white managers are like do have unconscious bias and do discriminate against black workers. Like that's a, that is, that is a real thing. And so, but the, then the question becomes, how do you deal with that? And the, this this same executive director that I quoted earlier had said, you know what? The most vocal people in my organization when it comes to race are white. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know there's something else. There's something else going on here. What, why is it, why it, why is it the, the white yes. workers? No, absolutely. Are, I, I hear yeah. that over and over again. And your story reinforced that too. Um, and it, oh, I mean, it's amazing. I remember watching in 2020, um, I was doing some reporting down in BLM Plaza and I watched a, a white woman in Lululemon yoga pants shout in the face of this working class black female cop that she was racist over and over and over again, berating mm. her during the height of COVID within inches of her face, telling her that she was racist. Uh, she's a, a working class woman. And because she's a cop, this white woman in $100 leggings felt entitled to shout that she's a racist in her face over and over again. I mean, it's, it's just completely nuts. But I, I, one thing I do see on the right is the a, a little bit of with younger employees, younger people in the movement adopting maybe the that mindset that you can sort of weaponize different pathologies or different um, experiences to mask poor performance. Um, and so you do and see that on the right. I, I see that. I don't see the like, politicization or the identity stuff so much, but I see like a little bit of, I don't want to call it like the cliched victim mentality, but people more likely to sort of try and exploit their role. And the real victims of all of that are the genuine, like the biggest victims are the genuine victims of discrimination in all of mm. this, because it's way harder as a manager when you're trying to, um, when you're listening to all of these claims about sexism or bigotry, discrimination in any form, it's actually hard to figure out which ones are legitimate in some cases because there's like there are a lot of people come to you with a lot of different workplace problems now, and I would think the biggest victims of this are the ones that are, are facing genuine discrimination who may actually even be less inclined to report it because they don't want to be lumped in um, with you know that sort of crowd where they feel like people are exploiting things, yeah. experiences. And so, I mean, the bottom line to me is that if people believe that organizing into a group is an important way to, to flex power and to make the world a better place, then you have to figure out how to actually function as a group. Yeah. If you don't believe that that is important, then fine, blow them all up. Mm -hmm. But if you do think it matters, if, if, if collective action matters, then you gotta figure out how to act collectively. This is the last thing I'll say. I think that's completely accurate. Um, but it gets into this vicious cycle where you're going to see the same things in the unions, and you probably already have in some cases. And um, the, the last thing I'll say is that's why we need to have consensus definitions. And our definitions in the past were not right. Like We did not define racism and sexism appropriately in the past. But we have better definitions and consensus definitions now. And when you broaden them, not only can we not communicate, not only can we not function, but we cheapen the, the real serious offenses um, and make it harder for the victims victims of those offenses to uh, face justice and to, to find justice. All right, and stick, stick around, we'll have more rising uh, right after this.